Good morning. Nice and crispy outside. I think our winter has arrived and we are thankful that we can do things in-house. All right, so I think let us just pray together uh, before we share some words with you and let's just go from there. Father, we just want to thank you for the power of your word. Lord, that you back up your word. That every word that proceeds from your mouth is powerful and has the, the power to create. And Lord, that we believe that your word is all powerful. It is my prayer, Lord, in this time, that the Spirit will quicken the word that is inside of us. And Lord, that our hearts will be receptive to the word, to that relevant word that you want to give to us. To be able to live every day in the freedom and the victory of the cross. By the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I just want to bless all the people that listen to us, all the people that watch us. Lord, I speak a blessing over their lives this morning. I thank you, Father, that you are a God that visits us individually and that your Spirit dwells in your children. And Lord, that the Holy Spirit and the promise of the Spirit is that, it, that He will quicken the Word in us and that He will teach us all things and we trust you in that. But we just want to say thank you that we're not in in this life battle and in this life alone, that you are with us. We give you all the honor and we give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen. All right. So I want to start with sharing a scripture out of John chapter 1 verse. I'm going to read from verse 44. I love this portion of scripture and this has been intriguing me for quite a while and I'm just going to share some of those thoughts with you. Um, you, know, you know how it works. You can pause the video and this is, this is not for your entertainment. I said to somebody in the week, maybe, maybe it's a bit of a, uh, just a bit of an excuse for us not being too friendly while we are being recorded. It is that the idea is for you to listen to what we say and not how we look. Uh, I understand that if it's not feasible to look at, it's not easy to do it, but, uh, uh, and my apologies for that, but what is important is the things we really want to share, and that which the Holy Spirit has been putting on our hearts uh, in the week, and we really want you to grow, we really want you to be challenged in thinking, and we really want you to be enforced and established in the truth of Jesus Christ. So, uh, let's just read here in, in John chapter 1, verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good come from out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I think we can have a whole sermon around that, the discernment that Jesus had. And I mean, Jesus being God, can you imagine the things that Jesus saw and what happened in his heart? I don't think we have a clue. Verse 49, Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Year after, you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That is an interesting scripture. Uh, I've been looking at some of the concordances and uh, it doesn't really say a lot. The moment that we read about angels ascending and descending, we think about Jacob's ladder. There's no other way. If, if you know that part of the scripture, you will immediately make the connection. This is interesting what Jesus said. He said, if you are impressed by the fact that I just knew you and knew things about you, you will see greater things than this. And we know that Jesus really used the miracles and the things he's done. I mean, he said to the Pharisees a couple of times, if you do not believe my words, believe in the signs that I do and know that I come from my Father. Let's just for a moment contemplate what Jesus is saying. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. 
you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on Christ. I mean heaven, heaven being manifested and heaven coming upon the Son of Man, which was Jesus Christ, which means that you will see in my life from here on, you will see how heaven operates through me. This is an interesting thing that he said. I mean, he could have said many things. Why did he use that? Well, he called him an Israelite. I'm not sure what, it, what Nathaniel's relationship with the, the Jewish faith was in, in that context. But Jesus says that Israelite in whom there is no deceit. It means that Jesus discerns something about the character of Nathaniel. Now, if we go to John chapter 14, we're going to read a couple of scriptures and then we will take it from there. He says, let not your heart, uh, John 14 verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, Show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, and you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. I love that this is one of my favorite scriptures. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Here's a couple of significant things that we need to look at. The one is that Jesus says to Nathaniel, Hereafter you will see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. It means you will see that the kingdom of God is going to manifest through me. You will know and you will believe that I come from the Father. And then in John 10, he says, and you will do greater things. You will do the same as I did and even greater things. Now, the only way that that can happen is if what happened to Jesus happens to you. That the source of Jesus' ministry, that the source of Jesus' life, that the source of Jesus' power also become your source also becomes part of your life. The thought that energized me and excited me was if, if Jesus became the place of connection between heaven and earth, which we know it is. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The other day I was listening to a sermon and people were once again doing the narrow road, narrow way, the wide way. Uh, I mean, we've been indoctrinated for so many years and I and I think we should walk the way that God wants us to walk. But I just want you to say that I'm not walking in narrow nor a broad way. Jesus Christ is the way. So when I find Jesus, I find the way. I am in the way. And now my life is now directed by the Holy Spirit. So now it becomes a relational issue as well. Understanding of the word, application of my faith, listening to the Lord, and also being what Jesus said I am. Now, what are you? What did Jesus say we will be? Jesus has come to manifest something that is of benefit to those that are in him and to this world, which is the connecting place between heaven and earth. So let's go to Genesis 28 and let's just go back to that part that Jesus uses. He could have used many things, but he didn't. And there's a reason I think that Jesus used this specific part, because there's not many instances in the Old Testament where there's this direct 
experience with the God of heaven. I mean, when God spoke to certain Abraham, uh, Jacob, now God spoke to Abraham. I love this because God gave a promise to Abraham and to his seed. And then two generations further, when it comes to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, when it came to Jacob, God gives the same promises he gave to Abraham, to Jacob. And Jacob experienced the same God, the same grace. It doesn't seem that Jacob was this great believer in God before this experience, and we will read that. And I think that is significant that Jesus used this. Okay, um, in Genesis 28, verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached the heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Interesting. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. The gate of heaven. Then, jo then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put his head and set up a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been loose previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, and the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Here we see that this, it's an interesting thing, because it is a time when people did not experience the presence of the Holy Spirit that much, only upon the kings and the prophets and the priests, where the Lord has chosen to manifest himself. Uh, people experience that when God chose to speak, and mainly God would speak through a prophet. But there's a couple of places where God him, himself really showed himself to people, and this is one of them. This, this is interesting. You know Jacob? Jacob's a big thing. We also call Israel Jacob. So the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Remember, we are the seed of Abraham through faith. Abraham became the father of faith. It's interesting that Jacob did not have such a powerful relationship with God in terms of experience. And that's why God gave him this experience, because God wanted him to know that he is a fulfiller of his word and promises. He's the God of Abraham, he's the God of Isaac, and he said, I will also be your God. If you serve me and you, and you walk in my statutes, now, remember, that, is a, that was a condition that God has set for the Old Testament people. And there was a fulfillment that happened. Now, interesting that Jesus used that thing. I do not know of a lot of other places where there was a contact place or a gateway, if we want to put it that way, between heaven and earth. And for Jacob, that, uh, for Jacob, that was the thing. It was a gateway. It was a place and he said, this is a place, this place. So he made that place. He called it Bethel, which is the house of the Lord. He said, this is where the angels of God ascend. He said, he said this is a good place. This is what makes uh, this place anointed. He anointed the stone on which he laid his head. And he said that this place is a special place. Now, I would, I would surely think that that's a special place. Now, in the charismatic church, we, we've heard, we've heard many sermons on portals, We've heard, heard many things on gateways and those kind of things. Now, if, if you think that your church is a gateway to the Lord, be my guest. I'm happy for you. You know, if you think that there's a specific place in this earth 
where there is a gateway, then if you want to put up a shrine, you want to build a temple, be my guest. But what God has done was, Jesus said, there's two advantages that go to the Father, because He will send you another helper, the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. John 14, 18, He says, I will not leave you orphans. He says, I will come back to you. And He talks a lot about the promise of the Holy Spirit, where He says, listen, my Spirit is going to stay with you and in you, and that's the promise of the Father. And we will bring the kingdom. In John 14, he says, the Father and I will come. We will make a home with you. Now, it's interesting for us to understand this. Because as Bethel, where Jacob had, there was a place where the angels of God ascend, descend. Now, Jesus came and says, I'm the fulfillment of that place. Wherever I go, I will be the contact point between heaven and earth. I have become that, that ladder. I have become that place of God's house. Where I am, I represent that power that kingdom and we saw it in the life of jesus we saw it on the manifestations of the kingdom of god in the life of jesus and jesus also said to his disciples when he sent them out he says go and tell them tell them the kingdom of god has come near so jesus was a carrier of the kingdom and he also made his disciples and followers to be carriers of that kingdom now let me, let me tell you what excited me about this whole thing. Is I've realized that if Jesus is the place, if Jesus is the one where the angels of God ascend and descend upon the Son of Man, and that Jesus is that contact place between heaven and earth, and that Jesus is alive, and that Jesus has given himself to the church and has committed himself to the church, it means that because we are in Christ and because Jesus is the door of the sheep and because in him we live and move and have our being, the reality is, is that we become that contact place between heaven and earth. It means that wherever we go, wherever you and I go, there is a gateway between heaven and earth. And that the angels of God ascend and descend upon your life because in him you live and move and have your being. Now, your revelation of who Jesus is and who you are in Christ will play a big role role in your understanding of what I what I'm trying to share with you now is that if you believe that you are in Christ and that the life that you live is in Christ and that Jesus is the way the truth and the life and that Jesus has committed himself to you in covenant and that he will never leave you nor forsake you it means that you are assured of the God it Jesus says that he and the father is one you are baptized into Christ you have Christ you have put on Christ it means that you have become an ambassador for the kingdom of God. It means that you have become a representative of the kingdom of God on this earth. He has given you the spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. It means that's a full package. There's nothing. Paul comes, he says, all things are yours. He, can, he says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. It means that when we find ourselves in Christ, then we become the recipients of that which Christ is and that which Christ does. Jesus says he does not speak on his own authority, but then he comes and he says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, that I will do for you. He doesn't say the Father will do. And other places he says, the Father himself loves you, and I will no longer ask for you, but you can ask him yourself. So here Jesus exhibits to us the benefit of being sons and daughters of God. He says, in my sonship, you become sons and daughters. It means in my relationship to the Father, you also get a relationship and be in a relationship to the Father yourself. But we cannot forget that we are in Christ. The word says, in Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So it doesn't mean I, I move past Jesus and now I'm in a relationship with the Father. You and I are presented to the Father in Christ. The life I live, I live in Him. It means I have put on Christ. I've been baptized into Christ. I'm not talking about the water baptism. I'm talking about being that you have put on Christ, that you are a new creation. And there's some of the previous sermons that I've, that I've shared, and I don't want to re-preach that right now. But what I want to say is this. I realize that if Jesus has become the place where angels ascend and descend, then you and I have also become a place where angels and descend upon our lives because we have become carriers of the kingdom of God. This is now problematic. Paul talks about, he says, the Jews are looking for a sign. The Greeks are looking for knowledge. And I think that the church really find themselves in these different identities. We find ourselves in a lot of identities except in Christ. And that is our biggest challenge. We need to begin to understand that what transpired in this transformation that took place in my life as a believer 
What did I really become? Am I in Christ or am I not in Christ? And I've said it also in the past. Am I now in or am I out? And there's some people that suggest, no, 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 you're in, but your behavior takes you out. And then I say, but then, then being in is a reward of something and it's not grace. And that's problematic to me, you know, and uh, that is a wet fish moment. It's when you, you, people must decide, are we now in Christ or not? Because the Lord says he's faithful even when we become faithless. It means we are sustained not purely by our faith, but we are sustained by our faith, which positions us in grace. That the Lord is indeed good and that the blood of Jesus is indeed enough to wash me and cleanse me and that I have been forgiven and that I am presented to the Father pure and holy in Christ Jesus because I am in Him. And that is the eternal abode. If we abide in Him, He will abide in us. I'm staying, I'm living in Christ. The life I now live, I do not live for myself, but for Him who died for me and rose again. I mean, that's what the scripture says. Do you understand what I'm saying when I'm saying that your understanding and your level of revelation concerning something is really something that empowers you to position into a place of victory and that there's an application value to that. If we go to John chapter 10 verse 1 and, and this is a well-known scripture it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own, his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. It's interesting that portion of verse 3 because Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I will go in my father's house, there's many mansions, I will go before you. Uh, and uh, that Jesus says, where, where I will go, you will go. And you know that the word is Ephesians, that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So it means that the revelation of in Christ might be bigger than what you think. The revelation of in Christ might be much more revolutionary than what than we want to give it credit for. And maybe that's our problem, that we do not fully believe that we can be in Christ. And therefore, we, we also will doubt that that position and that authority that God has given us because we doubt that whether we are, who we are is good enough. You must ask yourself whether the cross, the Jesus on the cross, it was finished. It is now done and it will forever, tetelesta, it will forever be done. It means there will never ever be another sacrifice for your sin. So if Jesus isn't, isn't enough, now for you to become born again, you had to enter into the death and also accept that, his sacrifice was enough. He represented you and me on that cross. And the Father said it's good enough. Uh, good enough for what? So that we can come home. So that we can come into the Father's presence. So that we can follow Jesus into that place. Verse 4. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. And they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the thing, and the things which he spoke to them. Verse 7, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. It's worthwhile doing a study on abundant life. Verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling is you is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep. Sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. So here we, we see a Jesus saying, this is, listen, I care for you. I will not run away. Now we must remember, upon the Son of Man, the angels ascend and descend. The key to, you, to your faith and my faith and our sustenance in life is, was Jesus true when he said he will never leave us nor forsake us? Was he true, John 10, when he says, no one shall steal you out of my hand. No one shall steal you out of my Father's hand. You need the revelation on the commitment of the Godhead. The Father and the Son will come and make their home with us. That's what Jesus says. The Holy Spirit will abide in us, with, with us and in us forever. 
We were born of incorruptible seed by the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So who are you now? What happened to you? What have become of you? That is an identity that you have to embrace. And that is a mindset that you have to accept and believe in your life that the cross was enough and that you have been redeemed and that Jesus now presents you as a place where the angels of God ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. If angels ascend, descend upon Him, they will also ascend, descend upon you because in Him you live and move and have your being. That is where the kingdom of God, you see the gateway, now, now your character becomes important because as a representative of that kingdom, everybody says, where's the miracles? Listen, miracles is not what the world needs, but sons is what the world needs, sons and daughters. Once we become comfortable and humble in the place where we realize whom we have become by the grace of God in Christ Jesus, then we come to the place where we begin to accept that we represent the kingdom. That's what the enemy does. Enemy breaks down that truth in your life and says that you're not worthy. The enemy says that, Oh, you want you say that you're son of God, but look at your weaknesses. And he takes the old law which has been fulfilled, and the requirements of that law was nailed to the cross. If you go to Colossians. And now we believe the voice of the enemy. This week again, people send a word by, by WhatsApp to us uh, concerning somebody that had some dream, some reputable prophetic guy. We do not consult the demons, we do not consult evil spirits, we do not take wisdom from evil spirits, we do not even if a demon appears to us and shares a word or a warning, I do not heed to the warnings of devils, but because the Spirit of God is enough. The Spirit of God is with us and in us. Why would God use a demonic spirit to speak to the church when the Spirit of the living God dwells inside of us? I mean, we really, we must check our dreams. We must check our, check our visions. If, if, you're, if you dreamt about evil spirits, maybe the Lord is trying to say something to you because you're not listening to Him directly. I don't know why. I don't know why God would use a dream and use a demonic spirit to speak to us. Here we also see that Jacob had a dream which was real. So it wasn't just something that God has used to show him and he needed an interpretation. The fact that Jesus used that same scripture means that Jacob's dream was truly God speaking to him through that dream. And that's why he had, he had such a great response to that. You and I have angels ascending, descending upon our life. Most Christians don't know how to apply any doctrine of angels to their spiritual lives. They don't know how they function. I do believe that angels are real. And I do believe that angels carry with them the purposes of God and that God still uses angels. I also do not believe that we become angels because in the Son we find an identity. And in Hebrews the word says to us that to whom of the angels did he say that you are my son? We do not become angels when we die. Angels are created beings for the purpose of being angels. We will be created to be sons and daughters serving the loving Father, the God of all. Once again, here is our challenge. It is to move from a knowledge-based thing, something that we understand, something that intrigues us, into something that's applicable. There's a lot of Greeks in the church. It means people that rely purely on uh, knowledge and think that knowledge will save them. The word says God uses foolish things to confound the wise. We have a lot of Jews in the church in terms of those that are looking for signs and wonders. That's not the purpose of the relationship. The purpose of the relationship is not to make God an exhibitionist. Jesus came for his own. We read it here in John chapter 10. But also Jesus says, but there's also another flock. That another flock talks about us, the Gentiles. So that there will be one shepherd and one flock. We have become part of that flock. We represent the house. We represent the king. And you and I, you are a place, wherever you go, wherever you walk, whatever you say, because of Jesus, not because of how great we are, but because of Jesus, and because of who Jesus is, and because upon the Son of Man, the angels ascend and descend. That's what he said to Nathaniel from now on. And then Jesus comes and says, but the same things I will do, you will do. It means that that angels, because we were drawn into Christ. So everything that is Christ will become ours. We don't know what that means. We don't know. We cannot define that yet. But all I know it is true. Because covenant, that is covenant. Covenant says, Jesus says, all things the Father has his mind. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he will take up what is mine. Paul comes and says, all things are yours. We do not 
we do not glory in men because all things are yours. But this is our challenge. We do not want to follow people upon whom the angels ascend and descend. Because the angels ascend and descend upon our lives as well. But because we don't experience it, we become men followers. We do not glory in men. The greatest, the things that men impress us with. The Lord has given gifts to men. And a lot of men are using those gifts to their own advantages. And they have to sort that out with God. But let me tell you something. There's one thing I know. There's no head boys and head girls in the house of the Lord. When we stand before the Father, we stand equal. Whether we have gifts, whether we are apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, whether we are ushers, whether we are just the car guards, whether we're just the people. It, we, when we are born again and we take on the name of Jesus Christ, we take up the identity of Jesus, we have the spirit of the living Lord living inside of us. But what have we become? We have become that contact place between heaven and earth. If only you would believe it. If you do not believe that all things are yours, if you do not believe that the kingdom of God has come close to you, that the Lord has given gifts to men, and not realizing that you have become the representation of the kingdom of God in this earth, you're not going to live like that. You're not going to apply that. You're not going to believe it. It doesn't mean it's not true. All it means is, is that you've got an unwrapped gift box. You've got a toolbox that you've never opened up. It means that you could have been much more victorious in your life, but you just never applied the truth. You could have been much more of use to the kingdom of God, to the glory of Jesus, but you're still trying to sort out your orphan behaviors. And that's John 14, 18 says, Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come back to you. And that word means to be fatherless or it means to be uncomforted. There's so many uncomforted people. And that's why people battle with unforgiveness. That's why people are still busy with earthly things and that cannot be heavenly focused because they're trying to fight an enemy that has already been defeated. And they do not see the lies because they do not listen to the voice of truth inside of them. The word of truth that has come to us, that's quickened by the Holy Spirit, why do you think we need discernment? What is the purpose of the prophetic? What is the purpose of the revelatory gifts of God? It is to give insight to the church to be able to be representatives of the kingdom, which we're not. And I mean, that is a shame. I mean, that is an insult in a way to the cross because Jesus died for what? Jesus defeated the devil for what? Jesus overcame for what? Jesus said it is finished for what? If we, if you and I do not step into that thing, say, okay, Holy Spirit, I concede. Lord, I lay down my life. I really need to hear your voice. The, the, the word here says, your sheep hear your voice. Jesus says, I am the door. He's the doorway to heaven. Let's quickly go there. In Genesis 28, verse 17, Jacob, and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. <laughs> then Jesus comes, comes and says, I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way to the Father is through me. Jesus came and said, In covenant, God made a promise to Abraham. And Jesus comes and says, I am the fulfillment of the promise. I am the door. There was a place which prophetically pointed to me. The house of God. Jesus says, I represent the house of God. I am the door to the Father. I am the only way through which you can come to the house of the Father. Now, there's a lot of people that come to the Father and yet their mindsets are not the mindsets of sons and daughters. It's still that of those of slaves and servants. Serving in itself is not a bad thing. But the identity from where you serve is a big thing in the life of a believer. If you believe that you are not worthy of being a son in the son, then you need to humble yourself and give honor and glory to Jesus and say, Lord, you did it all. Or do you still want to do something for yourself? Is there something you want to sacrifice? Is there something you want to add to the sacrifice, to the price that's been paid? Is there something you want to add and say, Jesus, I just want to do one small thing that you forgot to do for me. I don't think so. I think we need to align our thoughts and thinking with what Jesus has done was enough. I can now enter with boldness into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. I am now called sons and daughters of the Lord, and I am a place where the angels of God ascend and descend because I have become a gateway between heaven and earth because I am in Christ and He is the way, the truth, and the life. And maybe that will change our minds a bit and maybe it will release confidence in our lives where we really understand that what Jesus has done for us and that we don't have this identity of 
of slavery and identity of sonship and identity of servants above sonship. I think sons that serve is greater in freedom than just servants serving the master. God is not my master. He is my father whom I serve. Maybe that's something that we should think about. Well, I pray that the Lord will bless you. I've given you quite a bit of scriptures, so please go through them. Remember to subscribe. It means it will just be easier for you to receive the videos. We are busy building a, a website which is interactive, which will really help you with Mark Ministry. For those of you that's been wondering about Mark, what is Mark? What is MARC? Mark Ministry is a leadership ministry that we've developed out of our campuses to serve the campuses. It is focused around the fivefold ministry, and we will share some more with you later on. But the idea was, in, because the countryside churches are small, and um, we have a lot of challenges, we have drawn from the gifts that God has given to the church to create a group of leaders, a group of ministers that minister to our local churches and that minister to our congregations and our campuses. So that is what MARC is. stands for Mapumalanga Apostolic Resource Center. It is apostolic in nature purely because the word apostolos is, it means to be a sent one and it means we are combining groups together and we send them to campuses to help and to equip and to raise up uh, in the context of the fivefold and also other ministries. So that is what MARC is. Everybody that's part of the campuses is also by default part of Mark Ministry. All right, so we'll give you some more information on that later. When we have the website ready, we will share a lot of that info with you. You're welcome to contact me. And uh, if there's anything that you feel that we can help you with, please do so. Please take the courage. We want the internet and we want this to be a tool, not just something that we present to you as in a speech, but we really want to pick up the relationship with you. We're also really contemplating the online church. We're really working hard on that. So if you would be interested to be part of the online church, if you're not in our area, in our region, and you feel you want to be part of the online church, please send me an email and we will make contact with you from there and we will take it further from there. Otherwise, the Lord bless you. Let's give glory to Jesus. To him be all the honor, the glory, and the praise. There is no name higher, there is no higher authority than that of our God. He is the one true God who has chosen to give all things to his Son, who also have chosen to share all of that with us. Glory to Jesus, and let's be sons and daughters. God bless you. Thank you.